Thank you everyone for joining us this evening for our virtual nutrition class. I'm Taylor Wilkins, Family Communications Coordinator here at Cool Kids Campaign. I handle everything on our programming side and all internal and external communications within our organization. Tonight we have Christina with us. She is a dietitian at Wise Supermarkets, the location in Brunswick, Maryland. She's been in her role for about eight months and we're very happy to have her here with us tonight. Yes, thank you for having me. Yes, of course. Thank you for being here and joining us this evening. Yes, yeah, so if we're ready, I can go ahead and share my screen. Yes, you have. Okay. Yes. Perfect. There we go. All right, so tonight's topic is going to be the nutrition facts label and some other common terms that might be confusing that are on there in a lot of different products. So starting with the nutrition facts label, we really wanna focus on the serving size. And if we look at this example, three fourths of a cup is one serving size and there are 18 servings per container. So this is important to note because all of the numbers below the serving size are gonna to refer to that one serving size. So in three fourths of a cup, there's 200 calories, two grams of fat, zero milligrams of cholesterol, and so on. So if we eat exactly the serving size, that's what we're getting from this product. But if we eat a little bit more, then we're going to get more from this product, more calories, more um, nutrients as well. But if we eat less, we're going to get less. And this is just important to note because if we have certain nutrition goals that we're trying to meet, if we're staying... Um, so if we're trying to meet certain goals for some nutrients, then we really want to just pay attention to those numbers and how that can help us reach our goal. And types of fat. So there's a total fat heading and then saturated fat and trans fat. For saturated fat, we really want to limit that to less than 10% of calories per day. It's not the best for us, and we really want to focus on those unsaturated fats that are better for our heart and just really overall health. Trans fat, uh, we want to avoid these. Our bodies don't process them that well, and they really just don't help us out that much. And on a nutrition facts label, it'll always say zero grams of fat because Technically, they're not supposed to have any in there, but there is a loophole that says they can have at least 0.5 grams of trans fat per serving. And the way that you would know that it's in there is by reading the ingredients label. And if you see something that says hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated, usually a vegetable oil or some sort of oil, then you know that there is some sort of trans fat in there. And then it's not necessarily the best option, but it's not the worst. So that's mostly found in peanut butter or really um, any sort of sugary pastry or processed food. And so again, this um, that 0.5 grams is per serving. So if we have more than one serving, we're really getting a lot of trans fat that we might not need and is really hard for our body to process. And next we have cholesterol and sodium. And if those are nutrients that we really need to watch out for, they are on the nutrition facts label. If we are watching out for our hearts or anything like that. Next, we have total carbohydrate, um, dietary fiber and total sugars are um, subheadings and under total sugars are added sugars. And this is where it can get a little bit confusing. So total sugars, is the um, total of the naturally found sugars. So um, the naturally found sugars in milk and fruit would be included under here, as well as the added sugars. Added sugars just has a separate line just so you could see a number um, distinctly from the rest of the added or the total sugars. So that is included in the total sugars. So for example, if the total sugars was 10 grams and the added sugars was seven grams, 
that seven grams is included in the total sugars and there would be three grams of naturally found sugars. So um, that's all kind of included in there. It wouldn't be an additional seven grams of added sugar. And you might notice that the fiber and total sugars don't add up to the total carbohydrates. And that's because not all of the carbohydrates fall into the fiber or um, naturally occurring sugars or added sugars category. There are other starches and carbohydrates in there that make up that total carbohydrate. And then there's protein on that list as well. If that is something that you need to be looking out for, we always wanna make sure that we're getting some good quality protein throughout the day, including it in all our meals and snacks. And at the bottom, we have our vitamins and minerals. So the nutrition facts label recently was updated and the vitamins and minerals that were on there previously had changed because um, Americans, we, we're, we weren't meeting some of the needs for other nutrients. So those nutrients were changed to vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium. So those are the ones that they really want us to focus on now so we can really see a number of what we are really getting from certain products. And the rule of five and 20 is just a kind of quick general rule that is related to the percent daily value, which is on that right hand column of the nutrition facts label. And so if something is about 5% or lower of the daily value, that means it's low. There's not a lot of that nutrient in there. And we really want to focus the saturated fat, sodium, added sugars. We really want to keep those nutrients around that 5% or less. And 20% of the daily value or more are just around there. Um, we really want to focus on the fiber, vitamin D, calcium, iron, potassium, all those really beneficial nutrients. We want to aim around that 20% mark. So just kind of when we see five, we're thinking that's low in that nutrient. We, we're seeing 20, that's high in that nutrient. And so we're going to go into some common terms that we might see on different products, starting with whole grain, whole wheat, and multigrain. I know I, when I was first starting out, I was just overwhelmed with all of these options and maybe it's not just me. So I just wanted to go through them to kind of clarify some of these terms. So whole grain means that it contains all parts of the grain, the bran, the germ, and the endosperm. So that contains all of the nutrients, healthy fats, protein, fiber, all of the really good stuff that we want from our grains. And it's a really good option. Whole wheat uses all parts of the grain. It just specifies which grain is used. So it has the brain, the bran, German endosperm all in there, but it's just from the wheat grain. So it's also a great choice. Multigrain just means that it uses more than one type of grain, but the whole grain, that bran, German endosperm of each type might not be used. So it's not a bad choice, but just being aware that we're not getting all of the grain from each type of grain. So if, if we want to vary our choices from week to week, just to have some variety and variety of nutrients as well, that's always a great option. And some other kind of terms, I'm sure we've all seen sugar-free, fat-free, sodium-free. That just means that there's less than 0.5 grams of that nutrient per serving. And it means uh, that that nutrient is either not in that product at all. So another one is gluten-free. So that was added to a lot of products recently because either um, because we need to be gluten-free or it's a choice. It was, a, it was very trendy. So I've seen water that says gluten-free. So obviously there's does not contain gluten. So that nutrient is not in the product or there is very little of it that it will not make a nutritional difference. So the important thing to remember here is that it is per serving. So if we're eating a lot of servings of this um, food that says fat-free, sugar-free, and there is a little bit in there, if we eat enough of it, it will make 
a significant nutritional difference if sugar is something we need to keep track of or if sodium is something that we need to keep track of. So just keeping that in mind, again, the serving size is really important. And low means that the product does not contain a lot of that nutrient. And there's different standards for each type of nutrient. So just kind of um, keeping that in mind when we are looking for different products. So low fat means there's three grams or less of fat per serving, again, per serving. So having multiple servings might not make it a low fat, low saturated fat product anymore, if that's something that we need to watch out for. But just having these words in mind while we're shopping and looking at these different products, just to have a little trigger word in our head saying, okay, low sodium is 140 milligrams or it's low in salt. So that is a good option. And on the flip side of that, we have good source and high. So if a product is a good source of a nutrient, it contains 10 to 19% of that daily value for that nutrient per serving. So uh, for example, on this nutrition facts label, um, dietary fiber pro provides 16% of the daily value for that um, product. And so that's a good source of fiber. As well as iron, it provides 10% of the daily value. So that's a good source of iron. And it can also, um, other terms can also be more enriched, which is often, often seen on bread or pasta products, fortified, extra, plus added. All of these terms in front of a nutrient means that it has at least 10 to 19% of that daily value for that nutrient. And high, it means that it contains 20% or more of the daily value of that nutrient per serving. So for both good source and high, we really want to focus on that calcium, fiber, iron, potassium, vitamin D, all of those really good beneficial nutrients that um, are found on the Nutrition Facts label. Of course, there are many others, but those are just the ones you're going to see most often on products. And other terms that this can be seen as. So on this cereal, it says high in iron. It can also say rich in iron. It's an excellent source of iron or what other, whatever nutrient might it might be. And switching gears to talking about some terms that uh, might be certifications and have logos and things like that. So starting with organic, it is regulated by the USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service, which um, means that at least 95% of the ingredients in that product have to be organic. And what organic means is that produce is grown without pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, sewage sludge, GMOs, which are genetically modified organisms. So they um, have been kind of modified in a lab to be a certain way ionizing radiation, which is a really scientific term for molecules. It's very sciencey. And so, um, and for animals and animal products, they don't have antibiotics or growth hormones. They have year round access to the outdoors and they are fed an all organic diet. And if all of these criteria are met, then um, they will have this USDA organic logo and you will know that it is organic. And this is a very reliable um, logo. It is um, very um, tested and there's a lot of um, third party testing and it's very reliable. So if something has this logo that you know it has met all of these categories. Nutritionally speaking for different uh, products, either produce or animal products, there isn't too much of a difference in terms of nutrition content or nutrient content, if you buy organic or not, if you really do have a, um, if you really wanna avoid pesticides for personal reasons, then you might wanna maybe buy organic or do some more research into um, how, what brand you're buying, what pro pro producers you are buying from to see what pesticides do they use if it's really 
um, something that you want to avoid or not. So as with anything nutrition, it is a personal preference of do you want to buy organic? Can you buy organic? Is this available to me? And um, things like that. Next, moving on to natural or all natural. You can find this on many products, but it has to be um, no artificial ingredients, no added color, and it has to have minimal processing. Um, it's not regulated as much as organic is, but in order to include natural or all natural, that phrase, you have to include an explanation of why it is used. And since it's not regulated, there's not very many um, people looking at why are you using it? So it's a very marketing centered term. So yes, there are a lot of products that don't contain our artificial ingredients or added color and have minimal processing that have this term, but there are a lot that are just using it for marketing purposes as well. And I wanted to mention that for me, this refers to how the product is handled after slaughtering. So are there any artificial ingredients added or color or how processed is it? It has nothing to do with the animal's living conditions. And that's an important kind of separation and distinction for um, to be made. And if natural or all natural is really important to you, and um, you can look for the certified naturally grown logo, which is a non-governmental certification, but it is another way just to kind of verify that, okay, this is truly natural and all natural. Grass fed is another term you might see on animal products, and it just means that they only ate grass and hay in that type of forage. It is regulated by the FDA, but it is not strictly enforced. So something might say grass fed, but there's a lot of wiggle room for the producers in there. So it might be, again, something you want to research about the producer or um, the brand you are buying from. So it is reliable because it is regulated, but not completely reliable because it is not strictly enforced. And it does um, only refer to the diet of the animal. It has nothing to do with if they received hormones or antibiotics. That is something different, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But the, um, if you really want to ensure that the product is truly grass-fed and um, hay, like that's the only thing that they consumed, the American Grass-Fed Association label ensures that the diet is 100% forage, so grass and hay. It was raised on pasture and never treated with hormones or antibiotics, so that really kind of encompasses everything right there. So if you see that logo, then it has met all of that criteria, and you can really be ensured that um, all of that has been met. But again, nutritionally speaking, the differences between the grass-fed and grain-fed animals there's not too much difference in um, their nutritional benefit. So again, depends on what you have available to you or what you prefer um, in terms of grass-fed and grain-fed. Um, there's, it's really up to you and what you um, would like to consume. And so raised without antibiotics or hormones. So these are two separate logos or certifications that you would look for. I just kind of put them together because they were similar in um, their definitions. So there, it means that there's no antibiotics or horm hormones that were given to the animal. It is regulated, but again, there's a lot of, a lot of wiggle room for the producers because they send claims to the USDA. So just a bunch of paperwork who that gets approved there's no in-person visit. So there's a lot of wiggle room there um, in terms of antibiotics and hormones, but the USDA does prohibit giving hormones to poultry or pork. So if you're looking for a uh, logo or certification on poultry or pork and you don't find one, you don't have to go searching out for one because they should be hormone free, whether it is labeled or not. And I just wanted to note that 
no animal can truly ever be hormone free because they naturally produce it just like humans naturally produce hormones animals naturally produce hormones it's this is just talking about the added hormones that are given to the animals to help them grow faster grow bigger so that's just what that is referring to and cage free and free range or free roaming so in referring to, referring to eggs and some poultry and some other um, animals as well in the free range and free roaming side of things. So for cage free, the chickens, they don't live in cages, but it's not necessarily they have all the room in the world. They, they can still be crowded with thousands of other birds and may not be the best living conditions for them. But since there's no regulated definition that is allowed, that they can be crowded with thousands of other birds. And there's no th third party audit or certification for this term on eggs or poultry. So it's not 100% reliable. Again, it's really just relying on the honesty of the producer. And um, so if it says cage free, then it might be, but they could still be crowded with, with thousands of other birds and not have the best living conditions but they don't live in a cage. <laughs> and so free range or free roaming, they only require the animal to not be caged and allowed access to the outside. So they are able to go outside, but they don't have to. So they might not choose to ever go outside. So that doesn't mean it's any better than cage free um, or any different really. They just have to be allowed access. And this definition is only regulated for poultry. So they have a certain amount of space they are allowed outside. So for other animals, like free range cattle maybe, they might only have one square yard of uh, outside area that they can go. So that's what that kind of means with regulated. Um, so that could technically still be free range because they have access to the outside, but it's not very big. So they're not necessarily gonna go if they even wanted to. And again, there's no third party audit or certification for free range or free roaming. So it's not necessarily 100% reliable, but it is just something that is offered. And again, in terms of nutrition, there is um, no real benefit between cage free or free range or free roaming as long because they might the free range and free roaming might might not ever go outside so there's really no nutritional difference there the only nutritional difference really is going to be between your caged chickens and your cage free and all the other ones free roaming free range pasture raised all of that um is going to be a little bit better in nutrition. Of course, the best would be raising your own chickens. You have the most control over that, but obviously not everyone has the time, resources, energy. I know I don't have the patience to deal with the chickens, but um, that would be the best, but really cage-free, free roaming, free range. Um, they are your be better options um, in terms of nutrition there. And oh, really quickly, Christina, we do have a question. Yeah. Um, the question is, does pasture raise mean the same as free roaming? So pasture raise just means that they have even more space to go. It doesn't necessarily mean, again, that they went outside, but they do have the option for more space and free um, roaming outside, I guess. So it's just kind of a progression between cage-free, they are stuck inside um, they, with no option of going outside, free range or free roaming. They have the option to go outside. They have access to some outside area and free or pasture raised means that they have even more access to the outside um, if they choose. And Thank that, you. yeah, of course. No, and that wraps up my presentation so um if we take if we have any questions we can 
answer them. And that is my email. If so, feel free to email me if you have any other questions that pop up later on. And so thank you. Thank you, Christina. If anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them or you may leave them in the chat. I'll wait a little bit before we move on. All right, Christina, I do have a few questions for you. Um, if you can only buy some organic produce, which vegetables or fruit are the best to select? Yes, that's a great question. So what always pops into my mind is strawberries. For some reason, they just kind of always have a high pesticide retainment. And so um, if you can, strawberries are a great option. But if you can't, obviously, it's not the end of the world. Um, and also apples, because their skin is so thin that pesticides could easily um, slip through there. So and also they kind of have a waxy coating on them to maybe help preserve them. And there are natural ways to um, kind of get rid of that with um, like vinegar or things like that, but that might be time consuming or just another step to your produce process. So um, just kind of things like that would be a good um, options to buy organic. Thank you. And it looks like we have another question in the chat. Are there certain target numbers I should aim for in terms of protein, carbs, fat, et cetera? That is a very loaded question. So um, yes, but it's, it's very individualized. So I can't just say everyone should be having um, 100 grams of protein every day. It might be true for one person, but very different for another person. It depends on what your goals are. It really just depends on what you need, really um, depends on your whole individual person. So there's really no one general recommendation that will fit every person. And I wouldn't feel comfortable saying everyone needs this amount of protein, carbs, and fat. It's very individualized. So talking one-on-one um, -on -one would be with an individual would be more helpful than me just saying, oh, eat this and number of that, this number of that. And would you recommend that they should talk to a dietitian or a doctor for that type of advice? Yeah, I, I would recommend maybe a dietitian, but your doctor can absolutely help you as well. Or even um, if you initiate that conversation with your doctor and they can maybe refer you to a dietitian um, or someone else that they think might be more helpful. Okay, great, thanks. Another question is, do you have any tips for serving my family healthy meals on a budget? Yes, that's a great question. So my go-to answer for that is utilize your canned fruits and veggies. Maybe look for um, fruits that are canned in 100% fruit juice. There are a lot of fruits that are canned in heavy syrup that have a lot of added sugars that we don't really need. So look for that 100% fruit juice. And for our canned vegetables, look for those that are low in sodium or have no salt added because they can really um, add up in the sodium um, content there. But if you can't find any that have low sodium, you can always dump them out in a can, put them in a strainer and rinse them off. And that will get rid of some of the sodium as well. And also in um, addition to canned fruits and vegetables, you can buy frozen. Um, they have just as much nutritional value as well as the canned. And um, it's really a good thing to have even if some produce isn't in season, you can still buy them canned or frozen and still get that great nutrient content as well. And they're very versatile and last a lot longer than fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay, thanks. You know, I have a bunch of frozen vegetables in my freezer. I just need to cook them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 
Yes. Uh, another question that we have is, are non-dairy milk, such as almond milk, better for you than dairy milk? Again, it depends. We can't ever say it's better for you. It just, they have different nutrient content. So regular milk has a lot more protein than the plant-based options like almond, oat. They have just different nutrient compositions. So soy milk does have a significant more significant amount of protein compared to um, cow's milk. But when we're looking at almond milk or anything like that, there's not as much protein. So it's really kind of what you're looking to get out of it. If you are looking for protein, almond milk isn't really going to be your first choice. You're going to have to have something else to kind of add that protein in there. Um, there it, but it does have some nutritional benefit. There's a lot of calcium that's added in there. So we get that good nutrient and other things. So it, it's really a variety of different um, milks if we can combine them and kind of have different nutrients there. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions, comments, concerns? Okay, before we conclude this evening, I just want to make a few announcements for our family. So we have a few programs coming up this month and next month. March 18th, we have Mosaic and a Match for our teens, where they'll get to create an art piece that will be used in our 15th anniversary gala. Very exciting. And they'll have the chance to play tournament style games with their peers. So it'll be a very fun night. On April 8th, we have our movie and Easter egg hunt, which will be held at our Towson Clubhouse. So we would love to see you there if you can. That's for all ages. Cool kids and their siblings will be able to watch a movie as well as search for Easter eggs. And I hear there's going to be a prize, so you may want to attend. The following day on April 9th, we have our aquarium bus trip. This trip we're limiting to 34 cool kids and siblings. You have to be over the age of seven to attend, but it's a bus trip. We'll meet at the clubhouse around 1.30 to get to the aquarium at two. And we'll have a tour of the aquarium. It'll be a really fun day and parents can come as well. They just have to chaperone a group of three. And I believe that's all we have for March and April. But I just want to say thank you so much, Christina, for taking the time out of your evening to go over the common terms that we might find on our food and vegetables, as well as the nutrition label. We really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. Everyone have a great evening, and we will see you later.